Hello everyone, my name is Manny Ramos, your host of Rise Up, Real Issues and Stories of Every One of Us podcast. Our guest for this episode is Dr. Kathy Ferrer. But first, let me talk about who we are. I'm Manny Ramos, a board member of PNAA and a past president of the Philippine Nurses Association of Central Florida. I'm a professor of nursing at Valencia College in Orlando and an adjunct faculty at William Patterson University. With me today is my co-host, Mindy Ofiana. Mindy? Hello, partner. Hey. Welcome, everyone. I am Mindy Ofiana, PNAA's Legislative Committee Chair, Corresponding Secretary of PNAA Foundation, and a past president of Philippine Nurses Association of Southern California. Before my recent retirement, I served as a dual role for the Chief Operating Officer and Chief Nursing Officer in one of the medical centers owned by KPC Group of Companies. So, Mindy, how was your week? It was a busy weekend. Uh I was in Las Vegas because Uh I attended our 25th Annual Convention and Leadership Summit of my alma mater, you know, University of Santo Tomas. We also celebrated the 75th Diamond Anniversary of our College of Nursing. It was great to see my old classmates. Reminiscing Las our Vegas. as young nursing students. It uh-uh. was beautiful. That must have been exciting. How was the crowd? It was uh, it was crazy. Everybody was just excited, very engaged. All all the individuals were smiling. Yeah. But behind the scenes, the, the planning committee knew that there was something going on. But it was <laughs> amazing that we were the only ones know that there was something going on and not the not the uh, guests. Uh-huh. So well, that's, that's a good thing. That's good. That's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. He says learnings. There's a lot of learnings, you know, so, despite the fact of all the plans. Were you able to at least have some, you know, leisure too? Uh, I know that was all, all business there, but... <laughs> You can't well, go to course. Vegas and not have some leisure. <laughs> no, I didn't play. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, no, because I, I don't play slots. I uh-huh. play cards. Oh, okay. And I play Pai Gao. And uh-huh. I, you know, they were close to each other. And I'm just, because, because of the COVID, mm-hmm. I was more careful. Oh, okay. And I just said to myself, no, I'm not going to play. Right. Next time, maybe. So did you fly? Did you fly into? I do. I did. You I did. flew. Okay. Yeah, from LAX to um. Las Vegas. Yeah. And people that were leave, so we were all leaving on Sunday. Uh-huh. And then um, there was apparently Southwest oh, Airlines. Yes, I heard. Did you hear that news? Yeah. That they canceled about a thousand uh-huh. flights uh-huh. and about four of our um, attendees got affected. Yeah. yeah. So, and she has an early flight at six. By the time she went home, it was at 10 30. Oh, my. I feel so, yes, others were, you know, very creative in what they were doing. So they flew to LA. I mean, they drove to LAX, yeah. and from LAX they went and jet, changed airlines uh-huh. as well. Was what happened to the yeah. for the others? But well, I'm fun. glad. I'm glad you were able to have uh, some time off. I, I know it's it's a reunion too. Um, you must have been happy to see some old friends. <laughs> oh yeah, yes. You know that's what I was saying a while ago. We the escapades we had. You yeah. very young nursing students, yeah. cu- curious, curious in many things, yeah. and so yes, well, it was good, wonderful. Very good. Well, um, so. Now let's uh, bring in our first guest for this second episode of Rise Up. This publication was made possible by Cooperative Agreement CDC RFA IP212106 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC HHS. With us today is our first guest for our second episode of Rise Up. Dr. Kathleen Perer is an attending faculty physician in the Division of Hospital Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases, Special Immunology Section at Children's National Hospital. She's also an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Ferrer received her undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering from Brown University and earned her Doctor of Medicine degree from the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. 
She completed her residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and eventually served as the medical director of the Baylor College of Medicine Bristol Myers Squibb Children's Clinical Center of Excellence in Lesotho, and assisted with a scale of pediatric HIV care, treatment, and prevention for the country. Currently, Dr. Ferrer serves as the education lead for the Children's National Global Health Initiative and is cultivating the next generation of global health leaders and educators by serving as a faculty mentor for Children's National Presidents and is co-director of the Pediatric Resident Global Child Health Pathway. As the lead physician for the Occupational Health COVID-19 response, she helped design and implement the organization's COVID-19 testing protocols, practice, and vaccination efforts for employees. Dr. Ferrer, good evening. How are you? I am doing well. Yeah, so you are based in Washington, D.C., a very exciting place to be. Yes, it is. It's definitely, there's always something going on for sure. <laughs> so why do you want to become a doctor? Well, um, that's actually, so I think uh, along with many of the nursing colleagues who are watching this podcast, I think it was a calling, you know, mm -hmm. ever since I was a, a child, that's definitely something that I aspired to. I had very early exposure to the hospital environment. My mom um, is a nurse. Oh. And so she oh. had uh, trained in the Philippines and then came to the United States in the 1960s as an exchange nurse. She met my father and then decided to stay in, uh, this, uh, in, in New Jersey is where she had both me and my brother. Um, and so I remember some of my earliest memories of being in the healthcare environment was my mom taking me to work, sitting at the nursing station, <laughs> waiting for her to get done. And then I distinctly remember going to pick up her check. So, you know, there was no such thing as direct deposit. I remember walking over to yeah. the, you know, payroll department, picking up her checks. That's and true. the other distinct memory I have of my mom was, you know, um, we would always get snowstorms. So not like Southern California and not. <laughs> like I remember being just amazed that the hospital would send an SUV to come pick up my mom oh. because she had to go to work. Oh, wow. Um, you know, my dad's an engineer. He never got an SUV sent for him. <laughs> so, well, for my mom, it was definitely um, something that she was. Uh, very passionate about always, um, you know, advocating for her patients. And I think that's something that she instilled in me. Yeah. Um, so nursing was always very near and dear to my heart. And uh, I didn't forget my father. I did do biomedical engineering as an undergrad. Yeah. And then I decided ah. to attend medical school. I see. So both I of see. them are retired now, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're both retired. My mom nur was um, in nursing for over 40 years. She worked at the same exact hospital, Muhlenberg Hospital in Plainfield, New Jersey, for uh, 30 plus years. She retired in her 60s, and now both of them are in their 80s living in, in Delaware. How are they doing? They're doing quite well. They are ready for this uh, pandemic to be over so they can start uh, socializing again. Um, our entire Filipino community that was in Piscataway, New Jersey, moved to Dover, Delaware. And so I think they have a more active social life than I do. <laughs> oh, so you say you don't have social life, but what do you do on your off days or, you know, when you're not, when you're not working, you must have something like a hobby. Yeah. The last two years have been just crazy where it pretty much has been nonstop work because essentially, you know, with uh, COVID being novel, it was a matter of creating new processes, new algorithms, new systems, and trying to really figure out what this virus could do and how we could stop it. Mm -hmm. um, so I really haven't had time over the last uh, now, what are we, uh, 19, 20 months into yes. this? Yes. Um, but when I do have time, I do golf. And that I did pick up from my parents. So both my parents, they golf. still golf, 80, oh, wow. 81 and 82. And they All still right. shame us because I will you know, only golf nine holes and they'll be like, you have to do all 18. What do you mean you're going to golf? <laughs> how, are the, how are the golf courses out there in Washington? I know in New Jersey, they have a lot of beautiful golf courses. How is it in Washington, D.C.? Uh, they're okay, but I will say that my favorite place to golf is the Philippines. Oh. 
Um, my parents mm -hmm. do. They uh, created a retirement home for themselves in Tagai Thai. So we ah. tend to go there. They go there every year. Um, and so they're there for the winter months, of course, to escape uh -huh. the snow mm -hmm. and cold. Um, so they're there from January to March or so. And then I typically go every other year to go visit them. And the golfing there is just phenomenal. Nice. So n DC just doesn't compare. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So when was the last time you went home? To the Philippines. Uh, it was right before the pandemic. Was oh. January 2020. So we I were see. in um, uh, Manila and in Surigao, and I think my nephew got COVID. Actually, oh. <laughs> but How is uh, he? he did fine. He had a oh, fever on fine. the airplane on the way home. Um, but uh, everybody, yeah, I'm glad my nephews got to go to the Philippines before this all hit. Mm, all right. Nice. Dr. Ferrer, you now work at the Children's National Hospital. How different is that uh, from where you were at Baylor College of Medicine? Oh, so, you know, I uh, did my residency in both internal medicine and pediatrics at Baylor in Houston, Texas. And then I didn't quite know what I would do after that. And eventually I found myself drawn to doing global health. And I ended up in uh, sub-Saharan Africa in Lesotho, little tiny country completely surrounded by South Africa, basically um, working on the scale up of pediatric HIV care and treatment. Um, and so uh, that again was very programmatic in terms of implementation and oper operationalizing uh, medical care and treatment for kids, finding kids who had HIV, um, testing them, treating them, and getting them onto life-saving antiretroviral medication therapy. And so I was doing that about 15 years ago in 2005. Um, I was the second pediatrician for the country, and we essentially had zero kids on antiretroviral therapy. So my job was to scale that up. Um, so from now at Children's National, it was so incredible that now I find myself in another pandemic. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> right, gosh. where almost everything I was doing now for the COVID um, epidemic, I was doing 15 years ago for HIV oh, in Sub-Saharan oh, Africa. Yeah, right. And so very similar in terms of the approach, in terms of messaging, of getting the community involved, of again, uh, so almost making things up as you go along uh -huh. and trying to figure things out because because nobody's done it before. That's right. Um, That's so right. very uh, similar in a very eerie way uh -huh. in terms uh -huh. of trying to deal with something new and then create new um, processes and systems in order to uh, protect people, mm -hmm. to protect, uh -huh. you know, for me, the way I got drawn into the COVID um, response at Children's was through occupational health. So mm -hmm. again, protecting our staff, our employees, um, and then uh, downstream effects of protecting our patients and our families. And so, you know, a lot of it was working with nursing, mm -hmm. was that uh -huh. the nurses in this pandemic have certainly borne the brunt of it in terms of especially in the beginning you know doctors could work from home sometimes uh, <laughs> right? tell us the nurses, especially in terms of bedside you know you have to go in yes. and they were literally doing everything um you know for all the covid patients oh, um, because see. nobody else was stepping up but um, nursing certainly did and so that's how um, I got involved with um, doing the COVID response and then also obviously doing the pediatric side of the COVID response as well. I see. So as the lead physician for the occupational health COVID-19 response, how was the experience during the design and implementation of the COVID-19 testing protocols and vaccination efforts for the employees? Yeah, so a lot of it um, relied on collecting data, which is, I think, something that we did well early on in terms of it, building it um, a database in order to be able to see what the patterns were mm -hmm. in terms of transmission um, within the hospital, and then to be able to reassure our staff, and then to make adjustments in terms of infection control measures, in terms of testing algorithms, which symptoms we needed to look out for, and who we needed to isolate and who we needed to quarantine mm -hmm. um, and who would likely test positive. Because as you know, there's a huge nursing shortage for one yes. um, and healthcare That's providers true. in general, especially now yeah. that you had to balance the risk of 
you know, uh, an employee coming to work sick with COVID versus absenteeism. Mm -hmm. Uh Because I know, I remember my mom, (laughs) she had the little calendar up that said three to 11, three to 11, (laughs) three to 11. And, you know, if she had to call in sick, that was, that was a big deal. Uh Um, And even more so now when you have, you know, limited uh, capacity of, um, you know, people to pull from in terms of um, your uh, uh, reserves. Mm -hmm. So is there like a vaccine mandate uh, at the hospital uh, now of where, where you are? Is, is everybody? Question. Yeah. Yeah. So this was something that we were probably one of the first children's hospitals to issue a vaccine mandate. Oh. And I think this was critical um, in terms of, you know, it's very critical in terms of turning this around. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And we issued our mandate in June. Oh, wow. <clears throat> In June, it was a totally different landscape. In June, in all of our hospital, we have about 8,000 employees. We had a total of three employee infections. Wow. It was at the nadir. June was definitely the nadir. And the problem is Delta came. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we didn't know how Delta was going to impact our our numbers, but they just shot up such that we hit you know, basically a peak in August, early September, where we were about 30% of our peak in November and December of the the, uh, prior year when that was really where it was, you know, hitting us hard. And so by calling the mandate in June, it was important to give our our staff time. Mm -hmm. People needed time to sort of get the information, the accurate information, as you know, lots of misinformation, lots of conspiracy theories that are just plain wrong. Uh-huh. Um, and to be able to, you know, get used to the idea that they would need to get back, so not only for their protection, but the protection of our patients yes. mm-hmm. who are children. Yes. They can't get vaccinated, less than 12. Right. Mm-hmm. And so uh, to protect our patients and, again, their families and eventually also the entire community. Uh-huh. Um, and so I think, again, having that forward thinking of doing the mandates early, giving people time to do their own research to get the messaging right, get the right information to the right people at the right time, um, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Um, That was really key to have then the mandate is we made it September 30th. So we gave people June, July, August, and September, four months to sort of start getting on board. And um, so we had a mandate. Yes, of course, we also had, you know, they could apply for an exemption. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, again, medical exemption and a religious exemption. Um, But in the end, September 30th, we did not have to terminate one employee. Wow. Congratulations. It was huge because, again, we know that some people just can't wrap their heads around it. And we know that they're good, good employees, good Mm -hmm. nurses, good Mm -hmm. doctors, good, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, technicians. Mm -hmm. Um, But they have whatever their reasons are. we just mandated that they had to um, they had to submit uh, for a declination or they had to get the vaccine. I see. You have mentioned uh, nurses and other um, patients and families. How about you as a physician? How did this affect you? Well, besides it completely changed my scope of practice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so essentially most of my time then went to um, again, doing a lot of communicating, doing a lot of town halls, doing a lot of huddles, because eventually what convinces someone to get vaccinated is not, uh, it's that one-on-one, that one-on-one interaction. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, again, uh, uh, finding those trusted messengers, um, mm-hmm. and getting the message out. And I think it also, um, as a practicing physician, um, I think the hardest thing to get used to was being in the face masks all the time and being in the pappers where you couldn't hear, you couldn't read people's lips. And it kind of changed the way you communicated with the, the families, um, where it almost put a little bit more distance. Like you don't know what they really look like. They don't know what you really look like. Uh-huh. Um, and I think that took a lot of getting used to. So not only could I not hear them, but they couldn't hear me. I felt like I was always yelling at them, <laughs> especially when you had that papper on and the uh-huh. fan is going and you just can't hear it anymore. Right. I can um, imagine. That definitely changed uh, sort of my perspective and my practice as a physician. And then I think teaching as well. So this is, I think, an unintended consequence as well, is that over the winter then for kids, 
you know, we didn't have a large volume of patients in the winter time. Right now, we're seeing our winter season come mm -hmm. in August and September, which is very bizarre. Mm -hmm. But in terms of both nurses and doctors, then um, the trainees, they didn't get experience of seeing mm. asthma, bronchiolitis, uh -huh. croup. And so a lot of our interns, they then became second years and they're supervising interns and they hadn't even seen it yet. Oh, right. And so there was this definite change in training um, in terms of having to go virtual and sort of the, the um, downsides of that, of not being able to really be physically hands-on. Um, so as a clinician educator, I definitely saw a change in that. And, and Manny, I know you're a professor yes, yes. <laughs> as well. Um, that whole change to go virtual just it was huge it, it took a lot of it, was huge. it took a lot of work yes yes you so, yeah dr dr ferrer you are a faculty mentor right for the children's national residence now has the number of residents specializing in infectious disease and immunology been affected by the covid pandemic as far as the numbers i don't think we know that yet mm -hmm. I think we're still in the middle of it, and we'll see those um, that effect in a couple of years or so in terms of people. I think will become more interested uh -huh. in, it in terms of you know uh, this is something that um, again not only is an opportunity for you as a clinician, but uh, certainly in the FDA, in the CDC, you know, in terms of other. Uh, opportunities for growth for a resident and other ways, um, non-traditional trajectories that this 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 pandemic mm -hmm. has sort of opened up as you see the importance of the CDC, right? right. In terms of making guidelines and all the data that has to be um, reviewed right. in order to make these decisions that have huge implications. And then policy as well. You mm -hmm. see where again, President Biden makes his mandate and that, you know, can change the course of the entire country. Uh -huh. Right. And so where yeah. you see that sort of impact. Right. Yeah, that's true. So although the weekly pediatric admissions reach a peak during the first week of September and has since declined in most states, along with adult COVID-19 admissions, there's uh, a lot of states, including Michigan, Oklahoma, Utah, Delaware, and Vermont, wherein pediatric admission rates have increased in the last two weeks, according to the CDC. Uh, we know that more of the older Americans are vaccinated in contrast to the younger population. Uh, with the relaxation of social distancing measures, cases increased across all groups, but more children tested positive relative to the uh, older adults. So here in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration gave full approval of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for children aged 16 and older and an emergency use in children 12 to 15 years of age. While this may be a welcome piece of news for many parents, some have questions before signing up their children for a vaccine appointment. So in your practice, how has the atmosphere been with parents or caregivers of children related to the COVID vaccine? So really, it's been a mixed bag. I would say, you know, there are some who are asking us to give the vaccines to their 11-year-olds and their 10-year-olds, <laughs> you know, who it's not even approved for because they believe in the safety and efficacy of it. It will protect the child. And not only that, it will allow some return to normalcy. And so it'll protect the child. It'll protect, you know, the family and the community. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly there are those who are saying, OK, well, it's OK if I get it, but I don't want my kid to get it yet. Because, again, the number one reason typically is they're afraid of the side effects. Mm -hmm. And the number two, they don't think it's been proven in terms of uh, the amount of time that has been spent uh, with the development of the vaccine. I see. And so, so oh. number one, the the data that has gone to the FDA and the F and the CDC to approve it for emergency use in 12 to 15, that clearly shows the benefit of mm -hmm. it, the effectiveness of it, and the safety of it. 
in terms of looking at uh, the number of side effects. Usually what people are most concerned about and what sort of really hit the news is this myocarditis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or basically mm -hmm. these yeah. kids that are getting inflammation of their heart or the, um, the uh, lining of the heart uh, a couple of days after they get the vaccine. Um, and again, they've reviewed all of that data. That's the one nice thing about, you know, the United States is we have a very robust uh, vaccine um, <clears throat> adverse events system for reporting. Um, so you can look at, you know, million data from millions of people. Um, and essentially what they found that it's a very rare, um, it's a very rare side effect. And not only that, typically kids recover from it. They may be in the hospital for a couple of days, but they don't have ongoing issues uh, with their heart or anything like that, that it's uh, something that happens and then it's it's done. And I think uh, the um, one of the uh, other aspects to think about is if they didn't get the vaccine, then they would have an even worse time if they actually got COVID in terms of the effects on their heart um, and the effects on uh, of potentially having those complications if they got COVID. Mm -hmm. So certainly better if you're weighing your risks and benefits to get the vaccine. And again, very rare in terms of the possibility of getting it and the benefits clearly outweigh the risks. I see. So if a child had a COVID-19 COVID-19, should they still get the vaccine? Yes. And oh. so the CDC has weighed in on this, that COVID-19 getting the acute infection may give you some natural immunity, which we think may um, protect you from getting reinfected for maybe 90 days, but we don't know how long that will last. I see. If you get the vaccine, that gives you again, another layer of protection in terms of uh, not suffering from severe disease or from death. Um, and so they still recommend that even though you've had COVID, even though you may have measurable antibody titers, that you should still get the vaccine because it just offers that extra layer of protection, okay. that the benefit still outweighs, outweighs the, the risk. any risk from the vaccine. And really, it's, it's uh, the mRNA vaccines. I know your other guests last week had talked about it, that it is a brilliant technology and has been in development for decades. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened, you know, in terms of the steps to getting to this vaccine that we were able to get it to basically bail us out of this <laughs> pandemic, uh -huh. um, that somebody <laughs> basically put all the steps in place so that we could benefit from all of the technology that's accumulated over the past several decades so that we can have this vaccine at this point in time. Uh -huh. And the other thing I wanted to point out um, is that, again, many people say, oh, but it happened too fast. So number one, it's been in development for decades. And number two, the FDA and the CDC did not skip any steps at all for the approval of any of the vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was they did things faster in terms mm -hmm. of they did steps in parallel as opposed to in sequence. Uh -huh. And that's how they were able to shorten that time frame, which instead of 10 years to one and a half years. So they basically took out all the bureaucracy yeah. and they made people work, <laughs> more people work um, on it based since it was a pandemic and essentially focused all the energy and all the capacity and all the infrastructure into getting these vaccines um, uh, tested, reviewed. Um, and again, because it was a pandemic, we had more people to test it on <laughs> than ever before. So they had all the numbers uh, and that's actually what, what, why it's taking so long to review because they have a ton of data. Uh, and so they can review all that and know again that um, with uh, a lot of volume in terms of the cases to look at, then um, we can be assured that they are safe. Right. Uh, Dr. Ferrer, you talked about risks and benefit. Now, uh, can we explain to our listeners um, if a child gets a COVID infection, how does it affect them? And what are the possible worst outcomes from a COVID infection in children that you have seen or know that about? That is a fantastic, fantastic question. And so that has been actually one of the silver linings to this pandemic in that kids have not been as severely <laughs> affected as adults. Mm -hmm. Um, thankfully, uh, again, uh, they have uh, <clears throat> been able to uh, have less morbidity and mortality compared to our older adults and our, our seniors. Um, 
And so what they, about probably 2% of kids who are infected end up being hospitalized. So much lower than, for example, you know, people my parents' age, where that number is uh, close to almost 30, 35%. Um, and so again, 2% of kids who are infected will end up hospitalized. Um, about 5 million kids thus far have uh, been infected with COVID. And of those 5 million in terms of um, death, it's less than 0.03%. Mm-hmm. So again, good numbers for kids, but it's still possible for the, I think there were approximately 500 or 600 deaths mm-hmm. of kids under 18. Mm-hmm. And so one death to me is way too much for something That's that right. we have That's a right. vaccine That's for. Right. So, um, um, oh, so go ahead, doctor. No, I was just going to say, so it's sort of what I worried more about in terms of for my nephews in particular is that not necessarily the acute COVID illness, but the possibility of Miss C. So Miss C is something that knew that I had to, we all had to learn about as pediatricians now. So uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Oh, and so this is something completely new, similar to Kawasaki. Um, disease which um, uh, we knew existed, but now occurring sort of in an older age group. And this is where you have multi-system involvement, um, typically occurs two to six weeks after a COVID infection, although in kids they may have had an asymptomatic COVID infection, and then you get this inflammatory reaction, basically a dysregulation of your immune system. Mm -hmm. And these kids are sick, and they end up in the hospital, um, and for potentially a prolonged amount of time sometimes three weeks, sometimes a month or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we don't know which kids that's going to affect and which it's mm-hmm. not. Uh-huh. Again, a re- relatively rare event, but mm-hmm. still a possibility. Um, right. And hence, that's uh, one of the reasons why, um, you know, better not to get it and not play with it uh-huh. than even risk that potential. And that's... then the other one is, you know, for adults, the scary part is long haul COVID, mm-hmm. right? Oh, Where yes, a majority yes. of adults who are potentially infected have symptoms for more than two months, um, or a large number do. And again, we don't know what that looks like in kids. It doesn't seem like it's as uh, prevalent um, in terms of long haul, but still something that, uh, again, if you have a vaccine, then why even take that, that risk? That's right. So I'm I, it's glad to hear that the posit- of the um uh, sickness or severity of illness for children with regards to this disease is lesser than the adult. So let's say a kid gets sick. How do we allay or alleviate the p- parents' anxiety when it, when their child is sick? I think it's the usual pediatric approach in terms of reassurance and having supportive care. Usually, again, most kids do quite well with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and almost one of the um, one of the uh, more difficult side effects is the fact that then they're not in school. <laughs> they're not in school for a longer amount of time, yes, and right. sort of the mental health impact of that has been uh, incredibly challenging. Um, so that's another reason to get vaccinated because if you're vaccinated, then the likelihood of you getting quarantined is going to be less. So, for example, my nephew, <laughs> he's gotten quarantined basically uh, twice in a row. So he oh. got quarantined, went back to school. Somebody at lunch was positive, got quarantined again. And so now the entire sixth grade is back on virtual <laughs> learning. Oh, wow. um, but if everybody was vaccinated, then you don't have to worry about that as much because you certainly have decreased transmission once you are vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Dr. Ferrer, one of the things that we've learned from this pandemic, this COVID pandemic, is how it has disproportionately affected the minorities. Now, I do know that a lot of the Filipino Americans and certainly the uh, Latino families have a multi generational household wherein they all, you know, in one household you may have grandpa, grandma, you know, and the grandkids uh, living together. So, um, have have you encountered um, any of these uh, families, uh, the children, the parents, um, you know, speaking about their concerns about this and how it has affected them? Absolutely. And I think that's probably one of the biggest concerns for the Filipino community in terms of our 
multi-generational households. Mm-hmm. You know, that was certainly one of my fears was that I would, you know, I spend a lot of time with my extended family and also with, um, with uh, my parents who are older. And mm-hmm. I think the worst possible thing would be I come home and I infect my parents who are, you know, more, um, more uh, susceptible to severe disease mm-hmm. and then something bad happens. And so again, uh, that definitely is one of the driving factors for the disparity in uh, the COVID uh, affecting uh, black and brown communities much more than other communities because of that multi-generational household. And the fact that, you know, Filipinos and um, a lot of uh, uh, our uh, uh, black and brown uh, brothers and sisters that they are working in essential positions. They're not in, you know, where in positions necessarily where, you know, they can telework. Mm-hmm. I e our nurses, uh-huh. right? They have to take transportation to get to work, uh-huh. um, and they have to potentially be in uh, crowded mm-hmm. break rooms uh, where they're exposed to others. Um, <clears throat> and so, certainly, I think that's one of the driving factors. Um, and you know, it, it, it also has uh, certainly a socioeconomic uh, aspect to it, um, where you know we would have. Um, uh, some of our uh, Latino families say, you know, I, I can't test because if I am positive or if my, um, uh, husband is positive, that means I can't work Mm -hmm. and that's my livelihood. That's how I put food on the table. Um, so I think that's actually your other question about how it's impacted you as a doctor. That was quite disheartening and really seeing that disparity grow Mm -hmm. and seeing it real time front row Mm -hmm. of how disparity occurs where the people who are getting you know hardest hit were again the most vulnerable again the people who um were most disadvantaged um and then uh seeing how then the the epidemic was impacting them even more so than others who already had a leg up Mm -hmm. that's right so how what do you think we should do as uh, health in, in to be able to get the quality with regards to um, take um, health in itself, health care in itself. Uh, inter- well, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think the vaccine is mm-hmm. is one of them, right? Um, in terms of increasing access to vaccines um, physically, so you're in actual places where. Um, people of color live and where there's uh, less dis- their disadvantaged neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in terms of messaging of getting, you know, to places and using trusted messengers um, so that uh, they can hear the, the accurate um, information as opposed to um, relying on, you know, conspiracy theories or relying to what they're reading on the internet uh, potentially or what they're um, hearing on um you know, sort of uh, echo chambers um, within, you know, Facebook or or wherever they're accessing their news. Um, I think messaging is a big, big um, aspect of this. Um, <clears throat> again, in terms of trying to uh, make it equitable access to information and to vaccines. So. We have one uh, last question for you, Dr. Ferrer, before we let you go. What would be your message to parents and caregivers of children who are still hesitant in signing up for the COVID vaccine for their children? I would say my uh, message to uh, parents would be that when the vaccine does become available for your kid's age group, we're anticipating that 5 to 11 will be approved by the FDA on October 26th by the FDA and then approved by the CDC on November 3rd. So it's coming up that when it does get approved, then get the kids vaccinated. And why? Because it provides protection for your child, but also prevents wider and continued, uh, um, uh, prevents uh, continued spread of the virus. Um, And lastly, it also blocks new variants from developing. Delta threw us a curveball, and we don't want another curveball um, because we could get this under control if, again, people get vaccinated 
you continue uh, with your infection control measures, um, and really that um, this is you know one of the ways that you protect your child, you protect your family, and you protect your community. Um, and really, it's the the best way for us to return not only to a sense of normalcy, but to give us some peace of mind, <laughs> so you don't have to always worry about it. Um, that really, it's that layers of protection of um, you know sort of assessing your risk and then using the tools that you have been given vaccine, masking, social distancing, ventilation, um, again, using all of those to your advantage so that you can protect yourself, your family, and our community. Well, we thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ferrer. This has been a most pleasurable conversation. Uh, you gave us a lot of valuable information uh, to our listeners and viewers, so thank you. Uh, we hope to engage you again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I had a great time. It's always wonderful uh, to, to chat with you. And uh, I look forward to getting to uh, talk again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer. That is all that we have for this episode. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Kathy Ferrer. And of course, my co-host, Mindy Ofiana, our director and producer, Rodney Cajudo, our executive producers, PNA president, Dr. Mary Joy Garcia Dia, and PNAA executive director, Carmina Bautista, and our uh, advisor, Nancy Hoff. And we will see you again next time here on Rise Up. Until then, keep on rising. See you next week.